about I've got about 50 minutes of material <laughs> that can't be put in here uh, but I'm going to as tight as I can um, use this hour so I want to get started I want to ask if uh, I could be just assisted a little bit after or during this meeting Steve as people come in if you would be willing to you know, just point out that there are these flyers here and make sure everybody gets a copy of that flyer it's called infant baptism it's just a handout for this class it won't be much good outside of this class all it has in it is every scripture that I'm going to refer to so it will be helpful in just quickly turning to and finding um, the passages that I am going to bring up this morning. So let's pray, and then we'll get into this conversation together. Father in heaven, we thank you for being our God and for revealing to us um, things from your word, some things more clear and very central and absolute that we can absolutely know and clearly hang on to and other things a little less clear and admitting that this is a subject this morning that is of lesser clarity lord we ask that by your spirit and through your word that you would speak to us and uh, clarify and um, soften our understandings or strengthen our understandings as you desire so we ask in jesus name that you would speak and clarify in Jesus name we pray amen well my purpose in this hour is actually fairly tight what I want to accomplish is I want to talk about covenantal baptism what's sometimes called infant baptism I want to talk about covenantal baptism and I want to explain why it is that biblically we believe that it's proper to apply the waters of baptism to our children we want to explain why we believe that's biblically the proper thing to do that's the first thing the second thing that I want to do is I want to explain to you what we believe it means when a person is baptized what is the meaning that God connects to our baptism so those are the two things there are a lot of things that I'm not going to talk about I certainly am not making it my aim to bring up every text about baptism in the Bible. I'm not going to answer all your questions. I probably can't. I have questions of my own. And uh, my point is not to try to be exhaustive. And my point is also not to present a forum here or a place to argue or a place to debate one, with one another. Um, my purpose is just to clarify what it is that we believe and exactly why we would take that from the scriptures. And I want to just say in advance of this talk um, a couple of things. One is that we don't believe that the timing of baptism, whether applied to children or applied to adults, is the most significant thing. And we don't uh, believe that the mode of baptism, whether by um, immersion or by pouring or by sprinkling we don't believe that those things are issues that we want to divide with other Christians over we hold our views and yet we hold them lightly and even when you think about um, membership at Grace Church this understanding of baptism and many other theological points that are held by this church and by the elders and deacons of this church are not required in any way shape or form by the membership of the church and you can see that very easily in our membership vows so I wanted to say that and then secondly I just wanted to say just as a introductory clarification that what we understand is that the waters of baptism when they are applied to an infant and for that matter when they're applied to an adult they do not have a necessarily saving effect there is nothing in the waters of baptism that in and of themselves is a saving institution it's simply water right it's simply water and it does not save there are churches where you will hear the roman church and many branches of the lutheran um, church would say that their sins were washed away in the waters of baptism or they were born again at 
baptism through the waters of baptism. We do not believe that. We believe that that is, in fact, an egregious offense to the biblical doctrine of salvation, which involves faith in Christ and repentance. And those things don't have, don't come through the waters of baptism. So just want to clarify that that is where we're standing. So as I am defending here the biblical basis for waters of baptism being applied to children. I don't want you to make that unnecessary connection and think, oh, they think that that's going to have some saving effect on their children. We don't. We want to talk about what it does mean, however. Now, in this subject that we're talking about this morning, the subject of baptism, we could begin with the New Testament. Baptism really begins in the New Testament in terms of as a word and as a practice, it begins in the New Testament. We could begin in the New Testament and there's a lot in the New Testament that we do need to look at to f- understand fully what baptism is. Or we could also look at um, the subject of baptism over the whole of the Bible. In other words, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So if I were to draw a diagram of that and make a timeline, um, say here, and then divide the Old Testament um, before Christ over here uh, from the New Testament here, Maybe sometimes it's good to use the word Old Testament and New Testament or Older Testament and Newer Testaments. But if we're going to hold those two together in continuity, then what my general precept is, as we are going to talk about baptism in the New Testament era, what I'm going to suggest is that there is a kind of an arc of continuity in not only what God is generally doing and and foreshadowing in the Old Testament, but even in the sacrament of baptism. And so I'm going to suggest to you that while baptism is the sacrament that is used in the New Testament, that there's a foreshadowing of baptism in the Old. And that, that, that foreshadowing is of circumcision. And we're going to look at that. And that would also be true in the other sacrament, the second sacrament of the church, which is the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And which has its, um, it, which have, it has all of its Old Testament background in Passover. So these are the two sacraments of the church. And all I'm saying is that in our approach to talking about the meaning of baptism and who it should be applied to, I want to see this not just in terms of what does the New Testament say, but what does the Old Testament say as well. And my thesis here, just in big picture, is that in both of these, we can see and learn a lot and gain a lot from our understanding of both the Passover, how it brings meaning to the Lord's Supper, and circumcision, and how it has a course bonding meaning to baptism in the New Testament. So with that in mind, then what I want to do is I want to begin with something that's probably, that I think we could probably say, which is more the common ground that most of us would all share, and that is our understanding of the Lord's Supper as the the continuation of the Passover. And there are uh, probably a lot of um, correlations that you're familiar with here, including, and, and these are printed up in your bulletin. Uh, one of them, um, you know, we have the Passover is um, Exodus chapter 12. That's all printed up there. You could read that. We're not going to take the time to do that. And then we have in the New Testament, we have uh, Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. That's also printed in there. Um, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. That's a New Testament statement that uh, undergirds that we understand that there's a meaning in the Old Testament Passover, that Christ is the fulfillment of Passover. And then, of course, we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. When they talk about the Passover, the last Passover, when they talk about that, the disciples gather in the upper room that last night, and they celebrate some crossover transitional version, don't they, between the Old Testament Passover, which is fulfilled in the death of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world on that very night of Passover. That's fulfilled in Christ, and Christ then reinstitutes the Passover 
Supper as the Lord's Supper with slightly different signs. And so I think that if we were to look at just in the broadest picture, in the broadest stroke, what is the meaning of the Lord's Supper and what is the meaning of the Passover, I think we could find that there's actually a pretty strong carryover in the meaning of these two. And what I might suggest is that the meaning... Here and the meaning of the sacrament and the old and the new are quite parallel. Not exactly the same, but like two parallel lines, they could be farther or closer together. But there's a parallel in the meaning of the, these two. The meaning in the Passover would be God's covenant people. are saved from death through um, a sacrifice of a lamb. And the New Testament meaning that's carried on into the New Testament is not identical, but it's similar. It would be this, God's covenant people in the New Testament, God's covenant people are saved from everlasting death through the sacrifice of Christ, the Lamb of God. I'm not going to take the time to rewrite that, but that's the parallel in the meaning. So there's great continuity in the Old Testament and the New Testament between these two in the area of meaning. The area where there's difference, where there's discontinuity, this is continuity. The area where there's a discontinuity would be in the signs. That are, that are used for the, for the New Testament and the Old Testament. So the signs. What are the signs that were utilized in the Old Testament Passover? We have a lamb, a literal lamb. We have the blood that's painted. And we have the flesh of that lamb, which is eaten. And it's bloody. And then in the New Testament, the signs are different. There's some carryover. There's a similarity. The lamb is not the lamb, of course. It's Christ himself. And the elements, the physical elements that are present would be the bread, which is eaten. And that's parallel to the flesh, which is eaten. This parallel, not the same. And then we have the wine. We use grape juice usually. And the wine, which represents the blood. And so there's a continuity and there's a discontinuity. And then the question comes, where the New Testament doesn't restate what's present in the meaning of the old, do we just discount and say, nope, Unless it's repeated in the New Testament, there's no continuity. Or do we say, what's shown to us in the Old Testament, we will hold on to as having meaning, except in areas where God changes that in the New Testament. So that's, a, that's really a question that needs to be answered. Can we put together the Old and the New Testament and say that the foreshadowings that God has used here are true in the and and carry on, or is there continuity or is there discontinuity? Now, I would guess that we have pretty much a similarity of view on what I've just described here. That in the Old Testament Passover, there are prefigurings and things, foreshadowings that become more real to us and understood in the Lord's Supper. And that the meaning is the same, but the signs have changed. And I don't really, I'm not wanting to talk about this. What I really want to talk about is the other sacrament, but this is the parallel that we're using to draw. And so what, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to take off the Lord's Supper here and the signs that accompany that. I'm going to take off the Passover here. And what I want to then ask is, if we are now talking about baptism, the New Testament sacrament of baptism,
is there, question mark, some antecedent to that in the Old Testament? And what I w would say in answer to that is, yes, there is, and that the Old Testament parallel to baptism, which God began, you know, 2,000 years before Christ, is the sacrament of circumcision. And that there is a similar meaning in circumcision as there is in baptism, although the signs will differ. And so that's what I'm trying to put together just for our understanding of trying to build a, a, a Bible-wide doctrine here. So what would we say would be the meaning of baptism and the meaning of circumcision? I'm just putting these together in the most broad brush terms and Maybe you would agree with me, or maybe you would disagree. That's the problem with broad brush terms. But in the broad brush terms, I would say that the meaning of circumcision in the Old Testament would be that it's, I'm going to write this out, a differentiating mark of God. It's the differentiating mark of God um, on the Old Testament people. And uh, then in correlation with that, broad brush picture of what baptism represents in the New Testament is, I'm not going to write that out, but it's the differentiating mark of God that's placed on the New Testament people of God. So we're drawing a correlation there. And, uh, and then we need to ask ourselves, well, what about the signs? Are the signs the same? Before we do that, I want to open up to our booklet. And in your booklet, turn to the page. It is page 10 that describes, that, that is just the copy of Genesis chapter 17. And this is the Abrahamic covenant. This is the Old Testament passage where circumcision is first given as that mark of the Old Testament. And later we'll look at how the, bap the baptism is first mentioned in the New Testament and how it's used there. But what I like to do is I like to just walk through this um, verse by verse and read it. You can see that I've highlighted, I've put certain things in bold, I've put certain things underlined, I have, you know, put things in capital letters. None of that's in the text. I'm just doing that to grab your attention to see some of the things that I would like you to see here. Okay, let's read it, beginning in verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant, my promise, a promise, a covenant is a sworn promise that I might make my covenant between me and you, Abraham, and between me and you and may, be, and may multiply you greatly. And Abraham, Abram fell on his face and God said to him, behold, my covenant, my promise is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will, this is the language of a covenant, these I wills. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. God is saying, and I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, an everlasting promise to be God to you and to your offspring. Notice the repetition of and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, the promised land, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. What are we seeing here? The first place we're seeing that this is a covenant that God is swearing. God is making a promise. There are some responsibilities that are passed to Abraham, but the primary aspect of this is God. What God is saying, I will, I will, I will, I will. I will make you fruitful. I will multiply you in number. I will give you this land. And then the twice repeated command, which is really the heart of it all, where God says to Abraham and to his children, he says, and I will be your God. 
and I will be their God as well. It's a remarkable, very remarkable passage. Let's think about what it means. That's the language of a covenant. God is saying, I will. He's making promises. It's promissory. It's an everlasting covenant, according to verse 7. There's a promise to make them fruitful, a promise to make him into many nations, a promise to be your God, and a promise to give the land. And you will note that God has been faithful to those promises over all of these now millennia, right? 4,000 years have passed, and God is faithful, remaining faithful to these promises. So the, um, the main point of this covenant is that God is saying something. He's saying something not just to Abraham alone, but he's saying something to Abraham and your offspring after you. God is dealing with Abraham and the family of Abraham, and he's making this promise, and I will be their God. I will be God to you, and I will be God to your offspring after you. This is the establishment of the covenant with God's people, and we often look back at the Old Testament and we say the Jews were, what, God's chosen people. They were chosen people. This is where they were chosen. This is where God is singling that out and describing that. That's a covenant then that he's making with those people. Obviously, um, there's something very precious here um, that God is doing. It's not these people choosing God. It, it, it's just one man. And it's not Abraham making I will statements to God. It's God making I will statements to Abraham and to his offspring. And he's promising to be their God. What does it mean when he says, and I will be God to you and to your offspring? What does that mean? I want to just ask that. Because does it mean that every child of Abraham will always be saved eternally into all the future. We know that that's not the case, actually. You look at Israel's history in the Old Testament, Israel's history in the New Testament, Israel's history since that time. We know that they've rejected their Messiah. There is yet a continuing effect where God says, I will be God to you. So what does that mean? What explicitly does that mean? That's worth teasing out. I'm not going to tease that out entirely right now, but the way that I would express that would be with this analogy. Let's say that I had 10 children and uh, some maybe adopted, some of my own blood. And I said to every one of them, by virtue of ad adoption or by birth, I would say to them, I will be a father to you. Now with that, there would be certain promissory things. I would care for them, I would love them, I would tuck them into bed at night, I would um, be faithful to their mother, I would want to also put a roof over their head and provide for them in the things of life. And, you know, if they were adopted in and I paid for one quarter of my own kid's uh, college education, I'd pay for them all. I'd say, I will be a father to you. I will do these things for you. I will be a father to you. Now, it could be that some of those children would turn 18 and say goodbye and leave my household and never come back, never sit around my table again, never come back for Christmas, never come back for Thanksgiving, in which case I would still be a father. I'm still their father. But they are rejecting me as their father, and they're going their own way, and that actually happens in families, doesn't it? That can happen, and it does happen. But that doesn't mean that I will not always be a father to that boy. And that boy will not always be a son to me, right? So there's a special relationship that is established in this covenant where God is saying to Abraham and to his descendants, I will be God to your people. And this is an exclusive thing. This isn't a promise that God is making to all the people of the world. He's making a promise to Abraham and to his family, those who come from him. Now, we see that expanded out a little bit, not much, but expanded upon. And we re we'll read together verse 9 and following. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. So there's the institution of circumcision. That's where it begins in the Bible. Uh, 
Every male among you shall be circumcised, verse 11. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign. It shall be a sign, signs, of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old, it's part of the sign, shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house, blood, blood relation, or bought with your money, even slaves coming in, or bought with your money from a foreigner who is not your offspring, who is not your blood and bones offspring. Both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. Isn't that an amazing thing? What a blessing it would have been to be a slave, to be adapt, ad, you know, bought by Abraham and brought under this great covenant of God. Wow. Shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, the sign be in your flesh as an everlasting covenant. And then there's the warning in verse 14. And any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people, for he has broken my covenant. And that's a, a strong and serious warning to take concern about. Um, obviously, to be cut off from the covenant, from the chosen people of God, would have been understood in the Old Testament, as we would understand it now, to be a most terrible situation to be in. And so that is what is asked there in the Old Testament people to circumcise and to circumcise. What does that what does that look like? Well, the signs of circumcision would be things like this. Um, it should be done on the eighth day. Every male Um, we could add to that, you know, um, the, your own flesh and blood, those who come under your, uh, your who are adopted into your household, um, every generation which would follow, not just your children, Abraham, but this is an everlasting covenant to go on and on and on and on. And then there's the caution at the end about uh, being cut off if you're not circumcised. And so let me just make a couple of notes here, three notes maybe. Um, you'll notice that circumcision was done to children chiefly, also to adults who would have been bought in, you know, as adults. But the, the, circum the covenant sign of circumcision was to be on, placed on infants, children, eighth day. It was mandatory and that those who did not receive it were cut off. Now what does this mean about the, about what circumcision is saying. Certainly then, it's not saying that these infants were already saved, that they had faith in God of any kind. It's not saying that. Secondly, it's not a guarantee of those infants coming to faith someday. That is not what is being spoken of. We know that that is not true in the Old Testament. Not every Jew became a believing Jew. Also, I think we, we could say that in the... Um, cutting of circumcision in the, in the applying of circumcision that the infant was not saying anything about themselves except perhaps, ouch, right? Uh, what they were saying about themselves was not, hey, I believe in God. They're, they were unable to say anything. And nor is circumcision primarily what the parents are saying about their children. What's being said in circumcision is God is saying, I have a covenant and I am establishing that covenant between me and you and your children. Mark them as such. Let that be a marker that they are ones whom I am promising myself to. Now, just as a sidebar here, if you turn over to the next page, there's New Testament language. We're not bridging into the New Testament quite yet, but there's New Testament language where the apostle Peter He's talking to the church. He's talking to the New Testament church, which was mixed with Jews and Gentiles alike. And he's speaking to the New Testament, and he says this to them. He says, you, Jews and Gentiles, believers in the New Testament, now you are a chosen race. 
You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a people for God's own possession. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. For once you, Church of Jesus Christ, were not a people, but now you are a peop God's people. Once you had not received mercy, and now you have received mercy. So what I want to suggest to you, maybe you want to just think about this, or maybe you've already decided where you fall in this, but I want to encourage you to think in this way. Could it, in fact, be that just as it was a glorious thing to be a child of the covenant in the Old Testament that Peter is suggesting here, that it is a glorious thing to be a child of God in the new, in the new covenant, and that there's not a categorical distinction between the people of God in the Old Testament and the people of God as the kingdom expands into the New Testament, and that God not only makes promises to the children of Old Testament believers, but he makes promises to the children of New Testament believers that as it was a precious thing to be born into the house of Abraham, so it is a precious thing to be a chosen child of God as a believer's children in the New Testament. And that just as a shepherd cares for his own sheep, he cares for the lambs that are born to him as well in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And so... If that's true, you can see where this is going then. Then is there a continuity in circumcision and baptism in which baptism means more than what I am saying about myself that I have faith in Jesus Christ? Could that be? That's the link that I'm trying to establish here. Or that I should say I am trying to establish that, but that I believe God is establishing, and I want you to see that. So we talked about the signs in the Old Testament. You know, the signs of circumcision to an infant and so forth. What are the signs in the New Testament of baptism? The signs would be um, water, baptism. Um, what else? Trinitarian formula in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. What else? Um, on believers, that's clear. And then I want to put a question mark here. And then I want to say, and their children. To be charitable, I'll put a question mark there. I, I'm trying to answer that, but... Um, this is a point, actually, where there's questions, okay? I think in all the rest, there's probably not an awful lot of debate. Maybe there is. But the big question, then, is whether baptism should be applied to children as circumcision was applied in the Old Testament. So with that in mind now, let's go to the New Testament, and we'll look at the, some passages from the New Testament. This is not comprehensive, but uh, here's what I want to suggest to you. When we look at the New Testament, we see two different things. We see examples, I should say, of two different things. We see examples where a person comes to faith and they are baptized, like the Apostle Paul, as an adult. He had no children. His children weren't baptized at the same time, by the way. We have another example of that in the Ethiopian eunuch. He was baptized, only him none of his family members. Of course, he didn't have any family members. He was a eunuch. He wasn't married. He had no children. We have when the gospel goes through Philip to Samaria, and it says they, baptized, they believed and they were baptized, both men and women. Sounds like most likely only believer's baptism there. There's one other place that I'm aware of in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 19, where people had been baptized with the baptism of John, which is d very distinctly different and not a Christian baptism in chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. It, it's in here. You can read it later. And when Paul comes and realizes, oh, these people aren't even saved. And so he rebaptizes them with a Christian baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there's a distinction there. And there it says 12, these 12 men, I think, 
individuals were baptized, and it doesn't say anything about infants there. Other than that, I think those are the only four cases, at least that I can think of or have found, where baptism is most explicitly for the believer and not for children in the whole household. Now, I want to look at the other side of things because there are other evidences that actually whole households were baptized. And we'll just quickly look at those. If you'll turn in your booklet to, oh boy. We're cruising toward a conclusion <laughs> oh, quickly. Um, let's go to page 13, the bottom of page 13. This is Peter's sermon on Pentecost where 3,000 people were saved. And at the end, I'm just going to read the bold font. Peter says in the closing call of that sermon, he says, So repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise there's that word again, which I'm correlating with the Old Testament promise. Maybe you don't. I do. For the promise is for you and your children and your children. The promise. What is the promise? The promise of God to be God to you and to your children. For the promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off. To everyone who will call on the name of the Lord. So I'm just suggesting here, it's not conclusive, but it, it seems likely that Peter here has in his mind that there is something being correlated in the New Testament and in the baptism of the New Testament that encompasses the covenant of the Old Testament. And that promise or a covenant of God carries to you as you believe in Christ and to your children. I'm not going to argue that, but I'm going to su suggest that that could be. Let's move on to the next page, verse four, chapter, uh, page 14. This is the conversion of Lydia as Paul's on a missionary journey. He's evangelizing. And we'll read the bold font. It's all there, so you can read it in context later. The Lord opened Lydia's heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, so she believed, and after she was baptized and her household as well. There's an example. She's baptized, she's saved, she's baptized, and her whole household as well. And after she was baptized and her whole household, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me faithful in the Lord, come to my house and stay. Another example similar to that would be in the same chapter, Acts 16. A Philippian jailer, same town, same city. He's converted. Just um, I'll begin reading back in verse 31. And they, this is Paul and Silas, they've been in prison. Now they're, uh, there's been an earthquake. Now they're freed. And they're speaking to the jailer now who has um, saw, asked, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them, the jailer took them that same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he, the jailer, was baptized at once, he and his family. There's a household conversion, or a household baptism at least, and then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he, the jailer, rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. So just another example of possibly, I would say in my mind more clearly, that the baptism of the one man who at least was believing was carried out for the whole family. And then we see in 1 Corinthians, Paul is arguing um, with them because they're siding up. I follow Paul. I follow Paulus. I follow Cephas. I follow Christ. And he's saying, boy, I'm glad when I came there, I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. That's verse 14, verse 15. So that no one may say that you were baptized into my name. I don't want baptizing people to become a divisive thing. And then he admits in verse 14, oh yes, and I did baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. He's got the same kind of amnesia that I have, and I can't remember what I did when I was there. But So there's another household conversion. Then the last scripture that I want to cite from the New Testament is Colossians chapter 2. And this is the one that I think um, most clearly, and maybe it's not clear. Maybe you feel like this is not clear. But to me, this is the one that most clearly 
identifies that baptism of the New Testament is linked. It's belted into, into circumcision of the Old Testament, that there is an arc of continuity between these two notions. And so just in verse 11 and 12, I'll read those, the bold there. In Christ, in him, in Christ, you were circumcised with a circumcision without hands. So he's talking to New Testament believers in Colossae who have been saved. And you'll remember, circumcision was not um, taught in the New Testament. They didn't tell believers in the New Testament, you must be circumcised. In fact, Paul in one place says, if you're going to be circumcised, you might as well cut it all off. It's not going to do you any good, right? He says that, Galatians, you can read it. And uh, here he says, in Christ, you also were circumcised, New Testament believers, with a circumcision made without hands, by the putting off of the body of flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. What's the circumcision of Christ? Keep reading. By the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Christ from the dead. And so I would just encourage you, meditate on that passage. Think about that passage. It's not as clear as some other passages, but what it does seem to me to be saying is that baptism, which is the mark of the New Testament, is being equated, uh, a baptism uh, uh, is equated with a circumcision done without hands, without surgery, without blood. And so that would be the one that I would point to primarily as a link. Now, I wanted to talk just in closing. We've got a, a few more minutes before the troops arrive. But I want to talk a little bit about the meaning, the difference in meaning between um, infant baptism or covenantal baptism and the meaning of adult-only baptism. And I would articulate it this way. I, I, I think these are the words that are typically used in Baptist circles. They would say, baptism is an outward sign of an inward change. In other words, baptism is a statement that I'm making about myself. I believe in Jesus. I have forsaken my sins. I have repented of my sins. I want Christ to come into my life, and therefore, I want to be baptized. And the, the conception there is my baptism is my statement of commitment and faith in God before the whole church. And I don't... Um, discount any of that you know that, that's a precious thing many people who are uh, baptized as adults they feel like that was a wonderful moment one of the most wonderful moments in my life what I want to suggest to you is that that's not the meaning of baptism that the meaning of baptism is not at least in covenant baptism is not what I am saying about myself but rather it is what God is saying to you. And I'll tell this to you in a story that is so touching to me, but I remember very clearly, we did this with all of our children, but when our first daughter was born and we were new parents, we had no idea what we were doing. I remember we brought that baby home, Abby, and we placed her in a little bassinet in our living room that we had bought, used, because we had no money. And we crowded around there. My mom, who's living, Harriet, and my wife, Erin, and myself, and we gathered around the outside of that bassinet, and we just prayed for that child. We dedicated that child to the Lord. We prayed for her hands, for her feet, for her legs, for her arms, for her heart, for her brain, for her mind, and we prayed for her, and we dedicated her to the Lord in every aspect. It was a very precious time. We prayed for everything about her into all the generations of the future and her own children. We prayed for the God's calling and saving her. And that was our desire. That's a statement that we're making to God. Oh, God, uh, please use our daughter. Please save our daughter. Please work in our daughter. That was what we were doing. And then a couple of days or a couple of weeks later, we brought that same little girl into church. We brought that girl into church, and she was baptized. And at that time, or sometime shortly after that, I began to realize the gigantic difference between what we had done in our home in terms of dedicating our child to the Lord versus what God is doing 
in the sacrament of baptism and what he is saying. Because it's not what I'm saying about my child when I bring my child up to be baptized that's the primary voice. It's certainly not what the child is saying about themselves. But even whether it's an adult or a child that's being baptized, the great meaning of baptism I would maintain to you is not what you're saying or what the child is saying, but it's what God is saying, which is, I promise, God is saying, I promise to be God to you and to your children after you. And that's a wonderful promise. I was thinking this morning as I laid in bed about the way that God has been faithful to me for all the days of my life. And I was going back to teenage years and pre-teenage years and just recounting how God had been leading me and, and uh, before I was a believer and causing me to have certain yearnings and then places where I was in a deep spot and I, and I needed help and I didn't have it in myself and God came to me. Difficult passages all the way through, I say. God has been faithful to his statement to me in my baptism. I want to just suggest to you, if you've been baptized as a child, and it's not something, you don't have that experience of going under the water and coming out and making a statement publicly about yourself. But don't discount the fact that there is something that is gloriously said, not by you, but about you, by God in your baptism, in which he said, I promise to be God to you. Does that mean that you're saved by those? No, it does not. Let me say that again. No, it does not. The waters of baptism do not save. Does it mean that you're guaranteed to be saved at some point? No, it definitely does not. Those waters of baptism acknowledge God is making promises to you, and I would encourage you then, as one who has been the recipient of those promises, to respond to the Lord in faith. Respond to him in repentance. Respond to him in faith. That's when a person is saved, not through the waters of baptism. Father in heaven, thank you for helping us in this short amount of time to cover these things. And Lord, I ask that you would um, direct and that you would correct um, words that I've said, um, beliefs that I've held, beliefs that any of us have held. Lord, we want to be conformed to what you're saying. And so, Lord, we ask that we would believe no more and believe no less, but believe certainly in you and what you have said. In Jesus' name, amen. There are a couple of other resources that I just want to mention to you. I've got two things up here and on the back of your, on the back of this now worthless flyer because all it has is scripture in it. There are a couple of um, websites that are helpful. There's a description of baptism from Brian Chapel, and uh, the website, the YouTube site for that is there. I found that quite interesting. It's about 12 minutes. It's, it's a short thing. And then... There's another argument, a debate, actually, between um, R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur. That's been on our own church website for a long time. These are two r renowned men who take opposite points of view. And, uh, and so you can, if you want to listen to the debate of both sides, that's on our website. You can find it just by going to the Grace website, clicking on links, listen to John MacArthur, then listen to um, R.C. Sproul. And then I have two... Little pam one little pamphlet, it's called A Brief Description of Baptism by Kevin DeYoung. I've got six of these, I think, if you're interested in that. If you want to read a little bit more, I've got another book called Baptism and the Covenant of Grace by Michael Rogers. He was my senior pastor and the man who's you know, tutored me and, and mentored me in ministry. I so much appreciate him. He has written what I would consider to be the best of the longer books on baptism. Thanks for being here. Could I ask for a little bit of help too? We're gonna need to take these chairs and, and these chairs over here and replace this row and get everything out of here.